a puzzle. Because technically, you're not alive. Except you're conscious, so we don't know what it means. Say so we're dead? Are you saying we're dead? Look, obviously I didn't mean you were really dead. Dead people don't move around and talk. Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you have entered that phase known as detox. I am Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the D program. In this episode, I am chatting with the pseudonymous Lux and New York Patriot, the tag team known as the Occult Rejects. They joined the show to initiate you into the new order of the Detox podcast. It's a fitting bridge from the old Occulture project. These guys are former Occult Secret Society members who say occultism is purposefully integrated into every aspect of society as a means of manipulating the public and protecting a fake elite. Hey, you don't have to convince me of that. They also say they're sick and tired of seeing the human race manipulated by magic and secret societies. And, I mean, same. So with that in mind, let's open our subtle ears, slap on our discernment caps, and do this damn detox thing. Enjoy. So Lux and New York Patriot, welcome to the show, man. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you guys for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for real. No no problem. No problem. I've been following your work for a few months now. I think it's pretty, well, to say the least, it's pretty interesting shit. You were in these occult secret societies. Lux, you were in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Patriot, you were in the OTO. I want to talk about why you guys left these groups, obviously, but I also want to know what attracted you to them in the first place. So Lux, let's start with you. What attracted you to the Golden Dawn to begin with and why did you leave? So I had initially become interested in the Golden Dawn because in around 2008, 2009, I began to get interested in the occult. And um, I was, I grew up as a Christian and a really, uh, I was a traditional Christian family. And I always would see things through the Bible that always made me kind of perk up my curiosity of like, what did that really mean? Or is there a hidden meaning behind, uh, you know, some of the verses? And so I've just always been curious like that, uh, even such an early age to try and figure out secrets and mysteries and things that you know, might be sort of hidden. So around that time, I began to look into a secret society that was legit. I didn't want to get into something that was like a male order, which there are a lot of those. Uh, I didn't want to get into something that that was dark occult or even practicing gray magic. And so I began to look around sort of like a window shop, different secret societies. And of course, the Golden Dawn is more or less um, probably, I would say some of the most concrete heritage as far as members and things like that. So I ended up applying, took about a year of a vetting process for me to get in. Uh, The longer that I was in, I noticed that there were inconsistencies and I would start to see strange things on my paperwork and my, uh, you know, official Golden Dawn curriculums and things that didn't say Golden Dawn or it looked like they had been uh, whited out. And so I began to have suspicions about there being an inner order to the inner order of the Golden Dawn, see, because I was told very transparently from the beginning that there was an inner order of the Golden Dawn, and that was fine with because I had been told about that. Then I began to find information that suggested that there was an inner order to the Golden Dawn that I didn't know about, and that instead of practicing uh, hermetics, that it was delving into Thelema, which is notorious for sort of uh, Aleister Crowley. Crowley was Thelemite himself. And, you know, of course, we'll go into New York Patriot stuff soon about him with the OTO. So that made me really uncomfortable because it just seemed the longer that I was going to be in, then the more I was going to be in subjects that I had absolutely told them from the beginning uh, that I was not comfortable with and not interested in. Felt as though that a lot was being hidden from me. And um, I don't thrive in that environment. It's a secret society, sure, but there should be transparency about the underlying belief system, right? At the heart of it, why am I going to stay in for 10 years if I don't know where where that's going to go? And it was just sort of this bait and switch and they would tell me one thing and they'd tell me another thing. And so eventually I had just said that I was going to leave and uh, took a little while to get out, but then um, received my paperwork, I would say probably 
maybe six months to a year after I had requested it for it to be uh, my name to be redacted. And along with some other crazy things that I saw while I was in there, that was just sort of the, the icing on the cake. And that's why I left. Yeah, you know, I we'll get into the inception of these groups in a few moments, but I just think it's interesting that, first of all, we call them secret societies. They're not very secret. Like, we all know what they are. I guess what's secret about them, right, is, is kind of what you're learning when you get in there. And then maybe some of the other shit that's actually going on behind the scenes, too. So same question to you, New York Patriot. What attracted you to the OTO to begin with, and then why did you leave? You know, I, I, I've said this plenty of times. It, it was not my first choice, too, of a place to join. When it came to starting to, you know, I, I had believed from, you know, getting into conspiracies many, many, many years ago. Um, I had believed that secret societies were, you know, influencing. And I do believe that they, you know, manipulate, you know, the human race. I, I was I did believe that pretty fast when I got into that stuff. So I had always thought there was something behind this stuff. I have always believed that there was magic, some sort of manipulation, if it's mental, physical, whatever. There is something that can be done. So honestly, when eventually I had really started getting into it, I was like, maybe if I learn this stuff myself, I can kind of stay out the matrix myself or, you know, I could see magic as being a GPS. It's going to show you many different routes to get where you want to go. So I had thought that maybe this will just help me with my regular life, regardless of the control system I'm in, you know, maybe I could just try to stay out of the bullshit and have a good life. So that is what made me get interested in those things. The OTO, like I said, would not have been my first choice. I could say I have respect for witchcraft and I can get into some of that stuff. And I believe it or not, as a ceremony magician, I did have a lot of that, uh, even I will say Wiccan influence to an extent in my practices, but I did not uh, feel that that was the type for me. Uh, I feel like a lot of that is kind of just like makeup as you go. I wanted to do something that was a little bit more structured and regimented. And I know I had like kind of like this is how we got results and this is what we suggest. So places like the Golden Dawn the OTO, and I, I can't remember, there might have been one or two other things I looked into, appealed to me. I was never really sold on Crowley. I thought he was an occult genius, but I also thought he was a degenerate at the same time, and that his ego probably destroyed him. So I joined the OTO because it was the only thing that was close to me. And uh, the OTO was not as structured as I expected it to be. Um, it does have officers and all that stuff, and it does have classes. But when you go there, you are not given like a mentor. You're pretty much just like have at it and uh, make some friends. So it wasn't exactly what I even thought it was going to be to that extent. But I still stayed because I figured this was a place for me to you know, learn from other people and to just figure out stuff, you know, maybe the correct way. Instead of, you know, you go on the Internet, you can have a hundred different ways to do the lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram. You know, so I figured at least sticking to a thing that stuck with one, I'd be able to stay focused and just move forward and not be distracted with the 10 other variations I could find easily. And uh, eventually, why did I leave? multiple reasons. One, I can say, like I even said before, wasn't my first choice. So I was also never 100% sold on being there. I had never 100% even felt comfortable. The type of crowd and the type of people that I had experienced, I will say for the most part, if people understand New York, I came from Long Island. I was not a city boy. So maybe, yes, I was from a conservative white area or whatever it is. But I can tell you once I moved out to the city and then went to that temple or that lodge type of people I was around, I was not used to at all. <laughs> and it was kind of like a shock. But I was like, I guess this is what witches and ceremonial magicians look like and act. So figured, fuck it. But I realized it was a very big uh, leftist breeding ground or leftist ideology place. Everybody who was a cool kid and in the cliques and that did uh, most of the Gnostic mass and most of the rituals and did most of the classes really did most of everything were all of people that were in that mindset. There was like maybe a few different groups, two or three different cliques that you would see oftenly do the Gnostic masses. Uh, they were normally all of that mindset. Uh, the only time I was ever really involved in that stuff was when I was asked from somebody who wasn't like them. <laughs> so it made it quite obvious you know, to me that, you know, I, I was uh, maybe uncomfortable around them and they were uncomfortable around me. I don't know what it was, but I obviously did not fit in. Um, I made a few associates there, but uh, you know, like I said, I wasn't in love with the place and I started to eventually start, uh, I guess, having my own magical experiences. And like I was telling you earlier, the way the type of mindset is being pushed there and the way, I mean, Thelema can be very sexual. I mean, because Crowley uh, just was a sexual person. I do believe that they push that a lot. And it's for a reason. 
Um, sex, in my opinion, will be one of the first things that can probably throw handcuffs on you instead of actually releasing you from any, uh, you know, the prison that we're in. It's a good way, I think, to just make people slaves in a sense. You will hide the truth because they will see sex and that's all they will see. So I, I didn't agree with that. And I just did not think, in my opinion, it was a safe place to uh, be at you know, having the magical experiences I've had, or even really talking to anybody about it. The type of vibe that goes on in that place is the, my opinion, the quite opposite of the type of vibe you would need going on to experience real magic. So I just did not feel comfortable being there anymore because I do believe after things that I've seen for myself and my own practices or even there, I just honestly believe that for the most part, It's just like how it is out on the streets. There is a pyramid scheme and there is a psyop within the order itself. It's definitely, you know, like you said before, the secret societies, uh, maybe they're keeping things secret that goes on in the order. Well, that's exactly what's going on. They keep secrets about how they're probably manipulating and using people. And I do believe 100% they keep magic still a secret to probably 90% of the people, you know, and I can't see why you would really want to do that unless the place is not what it seems. And that, and then eventually they started promoting BLM and Antifa, so I left. Yeah, I've heard you guys talk about that before, um, the sort of, I guess, infusion of leftist thinking, progressive thinking. Dudes, I have seen that in my own life when I was doing the O'Culture podcast. I got canceled a couple of times by listeners <laughs> for talking about the wrong things. And I was like, okay, you know, I assume that people who pursued the occult were critical thinkers, open-minded I found that that actually wasn't true. They were very, I guess, easily persuaded and manipulated and able to be herded into groupthink. Because, you know, there was was even times when I'd be like, you know, sitting there in the lodge waiting for like the mass to go on or something to happen. You know, we'll all be sitting there. And it's like, I could hear hear other people's conversations. And sometimes I'm like, yo, like we're here learning about magic. And I'm, you're fucking spazzing out over this fucking petty discussion I'm hearing you talking about. Like, I was just Mm -hmm. like... I, I just realized I was like, this is all the all you motherfuckers are filled with emotions. Like, it's just like, how how does that work with magic? You have to kind of be logical and statistical and kind of, you know, release those things to, to deal with it. It just didn't make any sense to me. I was just like, how how is this? How is this supposed to work for these people? Well, I told you before we got on the, the actual recording here, and I think this was Lux before you showed up, but I mentioned that I thought that a lot of people came to this through trauma because I did. And I feel like what you might be getting out there with your response was they have a lot of emotional trauma build up, a lot of psychological trauma build up that they try to funnel into these groups or these activities or these belief systems without actually working on themselves, which I think is yeah. the point of magic. And the Right. That's exactly it. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think from my experience in the OTO, like you said, you're supposed to work on yourself. I think that when people are doing shadow work, the OTO is the type of embrace that part and not get rid of it. Because it tends to be the quite opposite of how you see the people act. They're not getting rid of what's holding them down. They're enjoying it even more. Yeah. For the Golden Dawn, at least, I, I would say that it's kind of a polar opposite in the sense that I got turned sort of off because of how unemotional they were altogether. Right. So it's like the opposite because the OTO, you know, they were really like reactionary based on uh, politics or their own emotions. But the Golden Dawn, I mean, for us, the guys at leadership, the the ones at top, they were so emotionless. It was scary. I mean, it was devoid of any type of I don't know. It just didn't even feel like a, a good place to be. It didn't feel like home. It didn't feel like the person I was talking to was actually listening to me. It felt like just were, you know, telling me to uh, get rid of all emotion altogether. And I saw that in the leadership. So that definitely uh, was not something comfortable for me. As far as the politics things are concerned, I mean, we didn't talk about politics much, but it was done in secret especially on like car ride homes from rituals and things like that. I mean, they certainly talk, but it was always in a whispered tone. Yeah. Mm. And I I just want to clarify something for the listeners, because there will be people who are coming with me on this journey that were on this whole culture podcast journey with me, and they might be surprised that we're talking about this stuff to this level. But I just want to make it clear that your beef here is not with the occult itself. It's with the groups and how they conduct their business, I guess, right? Right. It's the thing that I use all the time to compare magic is electricity, right? So the occult is a, it's a lost technology or 
uh, forbidden or hidden technology. Had you gone to someone in the 1600s and shown them electricity through a light bulb, they would have called that magic, you know, <laughs> or, or thought you were crazy or something like that. But nonetheless, it works because it's a science. Obviously, electricity really exists naturally. But the same thing with the occult is that it exists naturally. It's just a hidden system. So I could never say, well, I have beef with electricity. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know what I mean? Like I have beef with the way that they, that they uh, disseminated the information, the structure, uh, the agenda, the priorities of the group that was uh, teaching me. The huge problem I have with it, and pretty much almost like what, what Lux is saying, the problem I have with occultism is that it's a cult. It's hidden. It's being kept secret. That's the problem I have with it. People's intentions can make it suck. But I think if people actually knew uh, what real magic was, if they understood the universe better, if they really knew what was going on, I don't think the situation would be as bad as we're in now. One, because you wouldn't be able to get over on the next motherfucker as easily because people will know what's up. And two, I do actually think it would probably uh, bring us to a, a positive place. But the problem is, not everybody knows about it, and the very few that do are sick and manipulative. Yeah, I heard this uh, really cool quote earlier. It actually kind of pertains to this. Uh, the, the manufacturer of the cult firearms, right? They revolutionized the industry because they created a whole new different type of firearm. And the quote for their slogan of this company for cult at the time was, God made all men, but cult made all men equal. Right. Insinuating that if everyone has the same firepower, then it makes everyone equal. Same analogy for the occult. Did not know that about the cult firearms. That's an interesting slogan or quote. And I would say and, you know, let me know what you guys think of this. But I would say the other problem with the occult is also that it's a cult. And I think that's actually what a lot of your research shows is that it's a collection of small groups that seemingly link together, which we'll talk about. But they have this this mode of brainwashing or manipulation, as you've kind of alluded to here, that makes it more cult-like than it does, you know, like to my point earlier, that there's a kind of lack of critical thought. There's a lack yes. of independent thought. So I'm curious, like, did you see any firsthand examples of cult-like behaviors, mind control, brainwashing, like these techniques that are pretty common as we look out into our society here or our culture? What did you guys see firsthand that really turned you off, I guess? I mean, I'm going to be honest with it. You know, I mean, I'm even going to be honest with myself here. I don't know about Lux's experiences, but if I was to even go back and look at everything that was going on in the initiations I took, I was obviously being fucked with and didn't even fucking realize it. You know, I, you don't put a cord around your neck and get walked around a temple fucking naked. That to me, thinking about it now, you know, if you realize how that looked, you probably wouldn't do it because what it looks like is you're a dog or a fucking slave. You know what I'm saying? If you really think about they're telling you, you know, representing something else. But if you think about what they're, you know, forget about what they're telling you is going on. And if you just look at it, look at it for what it is, I'm being fucking played. That was one of the things. But uh, yeah, from the initiations, I can tell you from the things that I've experienced and that I've looked at, I could definitely see that I think there is a slow step to see how far somebody's willing to go to get to the next step. And I think uh, that also lets them know what the person is willing to do. I will say, I think I left it out because I know you listen to tinfoil. I wish I would have brought it up there. It's definitely a cult because once you get to the seventh or eighth degree, you have to actually turn your stuff over to them. You will sign over your shit to the OTO. So that obviously cult-like. And when you take a specific degree in the OTO, you will have most of the degrees, they will read off some minor things that are needed for you in order to, to get to that degree. So that's how I found that out. Not making it up. It wasn't hearsay. It was actually told to me after an initiation before it finally closed and everything was over. I was at a legit OTO thing that I was told that about. So when I heard that, I knew my days were done already to begin with. But I mean, I, I can say for women, after you take a certain degree, uh, they will be carving something into themselves. If that person's okay with doing that for that place, I could say uh, they, they pretty much own that person. You've got that person manipulated, but they're okay with doing that to themselves in the name of, you know, whatever the fuck they're telling you. You know, in the first degree, they're going to tell you that you can't finish unless you get naked. You know, they're going to tell you, you know, you're going to have to 
take off all your clothes now and then we'll walk you back into the temple. You know, and if you don't do it, it's it's done, it's over. You don't go any farther. So, I mean, they, they make you do that. I'm pretty sure that's just to see what you're willing to do besides whatever type of uh, look they're trying to, uh, you know, get or whatever. You know, if, there is messages in there too. I mean, there is things that they are showing you in this stuff, but I do think a lot of it is just to see also uh, how far can we push this person. And I'll even say in one of their degrees, this was another reason why I left too. And I feel like they're even warning you. They have warned you so many times, I think, before you get too far. In the first degree, they will end it off as like one of the final thoughts, the final things they're talking about is to only trust yourself. They make that very apparent at the end of the first degree, if you're listening. Only trust yourself. Then later on in other degrees, they will revisit that whole idea about only trusting yourself. There is a time when they will bring you up to a thing that's the size of a tub, a big jacuzzi. And they will tell you to go in there and get a drink for you, you know, quench your thirst. They tell you some really weird ass way to fucking bend in and grab it to where it's probably impossible to do it anyway. But the whole thing is for you to bend in and then the two other people behind you push you in. You come out, lesson learned. Don't trust your own brothers and sisters. Don't trust your own siblings. Only trust yourself. Then you get to another thing in the same degree when now you're telling you to stick your thumb. They give you this little piece of wood with a bolt in it. Tell you stick your thumb in there and twist it down. Show us how far you can go and take the pain for you to show your devotion. I didn't go all that crazy. I put it down. I was like, all right, this is getting uncomfortable. And I said, okay, here. I wasn't trying to be a fucking hero or impress anybody. Uh, And then like, okay, it doesn't look that bad. They unscrew it. Then they show me at the bottom of the piece of wood, there was a hole in the piece of wood. I could have stuck my finger in that hole, twisted down the other screw and never felt the thing and went all the way down. Lesson to that was to that everything is not what it seems. You may not always know your surroundings and what's really going on. Now, why are you fucking pushing that so hard in one of your own degrees? You're telling me not to trust the lodge. You're telling me not to trust my brothers and sisters here. Is there something you're trying to tell me? Because then after this point, we've told this motherfucker so many times he deserves what he gets now. That's exactly what I think they're doing as well. And I had caught that and realized that to me, that even seemed, I know it may not be cultish to you, but it's like, I even feel like, you know, we're telling you what's up and you're ignoring it. So now, you know, whatever, you know, I do think that's a part of it. I think they're, they're letting you know, and then If you ignore it, they will put the sigh up on you at some point and they can get away with doing it. They can use magic on you now because you have allowed it. Yeah, from my own experience, I totally agree with New York Patriot. I think that the uh, Golden Dawn is a little bit, I don't know, they're a little bit more secretive about that than, than the OTO is. But I think the intention is still the same. I can remember one of the first things, again, so the whole vetting process of the Golden Dawn is they wanted to know everything about me. They wanted my deepest, darkest secrets. Now, that was before even initiation. And then I was speaking to the people who were going to initiate me. I was sitting there at the time with my girlfriend. She had decided she wanted to come to initiation with me. And the guy, who was one of the guys who was you know, one of the head guys at the temple, looked at us and said, don't worry. This initiation isn't where we fuck you in the ass. Well, that's anyone, always a joke in the OTO as well. Right. Now, oh. to anyone, that's a joke, right? But think about it on a subliminal, in subliminal terms. They are taking ownership of you. Not only are they taking ownership of you, but they're taking ownership of you over your girlfriend while she sits right next to you. You know, it's this subliminal message of, well, it might not happen today, but it could. And what are you going to do about it, really? And it was just always this strange bait and switch, like I had said before. I mean, the the further I would go up, you know, things would be changing. Oh, well, what you learned last time. Oh, that doesn't really apply now. We That was something secret. It's a metaphor. It really means this. And so it just felt as if, like, as soon as I would get something established, then it would be pulled out from under me. And then it would a whole new meaning, you know, and, and I'm not saying a whole new meaning of like, oh, well, this. Uh, different versions of this could mean something else. I'm saying, no, we lied to you. It actually means this. And so like, it just began this process of me never feeling as though anything that I had ever learned was actually concrete in the sense of this was a, you know, an actual magical principle or system that I could rely on because it was always changing. And, 
you know, I've always been one to really trust my gut. And I wish that I would have done it more during those early days. But just the whole ambiance, the atmosphere of being around these people, it was like your, your free speech, your free thought was encouraged up until a point. But after that, it's very rigorous, very strict. And if you don't agree, then you're more or less ostracized or you don't move up the ranks quite as quickly. And there were a bunch of times where I won't go too deep into it because definitely gives a lot of info, but there was a specific subject that I was studying. Now with the Golden Dawn, I did have a mentor and the subjects that I was studying, I felt like this was a really big breakthrough, like something really big. I was making a a magical connection between the Sephirotic Tree of Life and dimensional physics. And I felt as though this was the tree of life was a rudimentary type of early interpretation of what was interdimensional physics. And so I started to bring this up to one of the people above me and they just nothing. No, hey, yeah, let's sit down and talk about this. I'm surprised that you, you want to talk about this or maybe I can give you some insight. No, it was just stop. You'll get there when you get there. And it felt like my progression was being stifled. And even just trying to get a hold of someone at times, if you asked in the wrong way, if you didn't use the right terms, if you didn't do it at the right time of day, if you didn't do it in the, in the way that they wanted you to, there was just this aggressive backlash that just, it was really aggressive. And it made you feel belittled. It didn't make you feel as though you had any worth. And then again, the longer that I was in, I saw that the people at the lower levels, they were free thinkers and, you know, really nice, friendly people to talk to. But the guys that were further up, it was just this cold, calloused, almost look as though they just had no emotion or feeling at all. And it's very hard to describe the look that they would give, but it felt like they were looking through you and it just didn't feel like they had any vested interest in your progression or your education at all. It was just do what we say. You're not going anywhere. It's a constant vibe that I got. And then even when I was finding these weird things in my curriculum where it would show clearly that our, our society was linked directly to the AA, which is traditionally a OTO affiliate, right? Not something to do with the Golden Dawn. It looked as though that it was you know, something that I would actually have to get into. If I wanted to take things seriously, I'd, I'd, I'd have to eventually go to the AA. And it was something I had already clearly said that I was not interested in Thelemic magic. So that was felt like a betrayal of trust. Honestly, it was just got to be too much after a while, started to trust my gut and, and would ask questions about these things. Why is it that I see these different names on my curriculum? And there was never a solid answer. It was always this bait and switch. And, you know, I had put so much trust in them, right? I mean, when you put your, a hood on and you're taken to an undisclosed location, you don't know where you're going after the guy just said, don't worry, this isn't the initiation where we fuck you in the ass, Right. And you still put a hood on, you put all your trust in them, you go and you do all of this stuff. And then that's the way that you're treated. It was just, uh, you know, the, the Golden Dawn always tries to promote itself as an academic school of magic. Mm. You know? And still, it's, a, it's an occult order. Yeah, but it's, it's academic. It's supposed to be a school. Yeah, that's why I was attracted to it and would have picked that over the OTO. It does. It does. Yeah, it seem like that. Yeah. And it was like, so it was very hard for me to wrestle with that idea that I was studying certain things that I felt were academic. And then I would present those ideas to people of me and they just didn't want to give any insight to it at all. It was just like, well, so you're just going to make me pay all this money until I get to a higher level. And then you're going to give me this information. How do I even know that that information is true? I, I mean, I've been a teacher before I taught for years. If a kid came to me and was like, hey, I want to know a little bit more about multiplication. I think I have a good idea how it might work. And then you say, don't worry, you'll find that out in three years. Like, no, you could just help somebody and tell them the information. And, it, and the same thing would happen. They, they, would, uh, they would grow in their expertise on that subject. And so it just became too much for me. I, I got these really uneasy feelings and I just decided to just leave. It's, it's funny that you mentioned that. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Ryan. Because okay. it just made me think of something when he, when Lux was talking about it. Um, started making me think about like how even like with certain rituals, uh, sometimes those things can change as you go higher up too. And, you know, how certain rituals might all of a sudden be like, oh, well, you know, this is how the way you really should do it. You know, once you start moving up and then you might realize that, oh, wow, well, what I've been studying and taught was kind of bullshit. I will, I will even say there's a, um, there's a star ruby. That's one of Crowley's own rituals. 
he's got, you know, two different ways that's written in books already. So there's already like, well, you know, people are like, well, which one do we use? Which one makes sense? The blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, who wants to argue about why? And then like, I'm thinking like, I got into that at one point. I started studying or getting into his actual rituals, not the ones that were by the Golden Dawn. So that's really the only difference too. I don't know if you know that. They, they, they use the same shit. The OTO yeah. will use the same rituals as the OT, uh, as the Golden Dawn, but then they will add Crowley's own specific Thelemic rituals, but almost the same, same base. They had, there was a book from a member that was like, I wasn't for sale online, but if you knew the right person, if they said it was okay, you could be given this book and you could read that. And that was my experience. Somebody that I knew that was in the Astra Margentum and the OTO, and that was, you know, somebody I got along with, very like-minded people. He knew somebody that was higher up that gave him a book and made sure he can give it to me, asked for permission. But like, I was allowed to read a book that was written by somebody in the OTO about a ritual that's not published. And that everybody can have. So, I mean, that even right there starts showing you, like, there's secrets within this shit. Yeah. And, I mean, even for me, too, like, uh, I've said this on other podcasts, but I remember the first time that us, as a Golden Dawn temple, used a Masonic Lodge for a ritual. That struck me as highly unusual because I thought that, you know, everything I've ever learned about on it, it's a standalone order. And, uh to be doing rituals in a Masonic Lodge really threw me off. And I know that there's like a lot of uh, Masons out there who have, you know, they've been in the Masons for a long time, Blue Lodge stuff. That's cool. Do your own thing. But you should know that there are groups besides the Masons who are doing rituals in Masonic Lodges. Yeah, there was, a, uh, there was an OTO Lodge that would use a, a Mason's Lodge every once in a while that uh, because of people knowing that, I think they thought that the Masons and the OTO were together, or it was actually the OTO Lodge. But somebody threw Molotov cocktails at a Masons Lodge because OTO members were going there. It had nothing to do with the Masons, actually. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They tried to light up a fucking lodge thinking the OTO <laughs> members were actually, you know, it was one of their places, but it was a Masons because they were using it. They thought it was theirs. So a couple of things before we get further into your research. Uh, I call it the incepted occult clown world. I can't wait to talk about that. But a couple of things first. Lux, you mentioned a few minutes ago that, you know, you had this connection between the tree of life and physics. You just sort of casually threw that out there. And it's funny you did that because recently I've been thinking a lot about magic and maybe quantum physics being the same thing. Like quantum yeah, yeah. physics being just like a sort of weird you know, sort of scientism rebranding of what magic actually is. I've not really researched yeah. this. It's just sort of a theory that I've been throwing around and have heard lightly discussed in some other areas. So it's just interesting that you kind of casually threw that out about the tree of life. Yeah, take um, if you get a chance, take a look at M theory. Uh, M theory is best explanation we have really as to how uh, dimensions are connected to each other, how they interact with each other. Now take M theory and you magic, they have models theory. right and yeah. they have they have literal models for m theory now take m theory and then superimpose it on the upper half of the tree of life and you'll see that there's eerily similar <laughs> it's, like it's it's hard to look at sometimes without thinking yeah this is actually just a, a, another explanation for the tree of life i mean me and lux have have even talked to, about it ourselves um we think it could actually really be the tree of life, a three dimensional object showing something. I don't yeah. think it's supposed to be flat. Like we're looking at it. I, I, I've had ideas, maybe something close to a dreidel, believe it or not. Exactly. Would be That's kind of how it would look. And if you want to get into like the whole thing with like physics and stuff that Lux was just talking about, it may not go deep into that, but it does touch on it and not to uh, plug our own stuff. But um, the Gateway Project, I still think that is a great show to touch upon about how those two can kind of relate and not to plug ourselves again. But I think and probably about a month or so, or maybe a little bit more than that, we're going to cover the Scarlet Whore uh, I think we're going to have to go back to the gateway because uh, I will really um, seal the deal with what we're going to try to show. There will be, I think, stuff with the physics and electricity in that series. Yeah. And first of all, I mean, you're kind of here to plug your own stuff. So don't feel bad for doing it. And Yeah, I know. I know but it's like, I'm not trying to be cheesy either, you know? <laughs> sure, yeah. Well, speaking yeah. of cheesy and speaking of plugs, let's go back to the ass fucking for just one moment. Because <laughs> I... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's a hell of a transition, right? So yeah. I um I just want to know, and you know, simple answer here, ballpark it for me, like from one to a hundred. How much are these orders and these groups just all about sex? Maybe the OTO is a little different than the Golden Dawn, but it seems like once we get into more of your actual research, it all just goes back to sex. I'll put it in this aspect or this way. Like I had said before, I think sex can be easily used to put people in handcuffs and to blind them from the truth. So for the OTO, I would say probably 100% because it's one of the ways they want to keep you blind. You know what I'm saying? It may not all be sexual, but the idea of sex, I'm sure they want it to be one of the first things in your mind. And there's a lot of occult reasons why you would want to use sex for rituals or talismans, other things. So I see why they want to use sex. I would say that for the Golden Dawn, it wasn't like right in your face. But something that we've discovered through our research is it seems though every order has an inner order. And that inner order has another inner order. And that one has another inner order. And the more you get into the inner orders, you see more of the sex theme over and over. Yeah. The deeper you penetrate these groups, the the more they're penetrating uh, themselves. <laughs> yeah. so, well, I'll even say too, I mean, when I, just from my experience, I'm not saying all the lodges, they are filled with people that do have some wild sexual identities or difference of opinions. So, I mean, even there, it just seems like somehow that is an importance to the people that go there. And it's one of the ways they identify who they are. You know, they, they look at that 1% of my sexuality and not the other 99 of themselves. And that's what they focus on. And that's a great person to join a secret society if you want to keep them manipulated. Let's transition that into some of your research, which does build off of what we were just talking about, unfortunately. But, you know, I said a few minutes ago, I call it the sort of incepted occult clown world. I, I don't know why I came up with that phrase, but it is just like kind of what you were saying. It's these orders inside these orders inside these orders. And then for some reason, the clowns and jesters and tricksters are all. That's what I thought you meant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're all part of the actual symbolism that takes place here. And I think the best place to start then is with the Masons and then some of the inner orders inside of that group. And obviously, uh, the ones that you guys have covered are the Shriners and the Royal Order of Jesters. So let's start with the first video clip that you guys did about those groups. You, <laughs> It's funny, you put a, a clip from a Shrine Circus commercial coming to the Memorial Coliseum, which took me back to my childhood. I actually went to a couple Shrine Circuses at the Memorial Coliseum in, oh, Fort, wow. Wayne, yeah, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's near where I grew up. Oh, fuck. So I don't know if that's the ad that you pulled, but I saw many TV spots that looked exactly like that in the same exact building. I think there's a few arenas around the country that have that same name, the Memorial Coliseum, but that was actually the one that I went to. So when I saw that clip in your video, I was like, holy fuck. Like, I just got like re-traumatized almost because never did oh. like the circus, to be honest. I don't so, think any of us did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's just, yeah, it's just an interesting environment. But, you know, tell us a little bit about who the Shriners are, whoever wants to feel this. So if you look at Masonry and you look at the Shriners and you look at the Royal Order of the Jesters, to the people who may have not researched these orders much, you would think that they're totally separate, right? But if you look at the Shriners, well, how do you become a Shriner? Well, you have to be a Mason already. And they used to have it so that you had to be like a 33rd degree Mason. They eventually reduced to that and stuff. But if you want to be a Shriner, you have to be a Mason first. Now, after you get into the Shriners, there's an inner order. And guess what? They are by invite only. It doesn't matter about your merit. It doesn't matter about your hard work. It's by invite only. And so, you know, the whole purpose of masonry is to become the perfected man. You are trying to weed out all of these terrible things about yourself and make them better so that you can, you know, polish the pearl and become more pure of a person. Then you advance and you become a Shriner. And if you get requested to join the Royal Order of Jesters, what's the first thing that they say in their initiations? All of the things that you've learned before are all, they've gone away now. You were such a good person for so long. You did so much good work that now it's time for you to actually return to adolescence, to teenage years, and to be, you know, this weird sort of degenerate adolescent like frat mindset. Boy. Yeah, it's like a frat boy. It's like a frat boy. And, you know, we've caught 
well, we haven't caught, but we covered them being caught all of the times that they were human trafficking, all the times that they were promoting uh, prostitution. And if you look at the royal order of jesters, this inner order, who are they made of? Are they made of just regular dudes? Nope. They're all either judges, lawyers, police officers or sheriffs, uh, CIA assets, very high level guys. So that's why you see why it's invite only, <laughs> because they're trying to get this certain type of person that has a position of power that can be corrupted. Now, Freemasonry, they know very well about the jesters, and so do the Shriners, of course, because they're all linked together. And they have done nothing after more than a decade, but what, like two decades of evidence of them human trafficking. And they try to say that, well, what the jesters were doing, this was like an outlying thing. This isn't something that happens all the time in Freemasonry or in uh, Shrinerism. Well, then why hasn't the Shriners or the Freemasons dissolved the order? They could do it any time that they wanted, it and they've never done it, which is kind of suspicious to me and points to maybe that there's uh, a little bit more to that order and why they don't want to get rid of them. Maybe they're a little bit too important, but yeah, for those guys out there who've been in uh, masonry forever and you, you haven't seen any of this stuff, well, most likely, I hate to tell you, it's because they keep you there at a certain level because they test you all the time to see your corruption level, like how far are you willing to go? And I saw that even when I was in the Golden Dawn. So it's always this vetting process. And then these guys who are at the top of Shrinerism, which is the Royal Order of Jesters, they're doing all of this crazy stuff. Nothing ever happens to them. And they get off scot-free. And to me, it seems as though that is the actual heart of Shrinerism because they're not the only inner order too. There's another one called the Order of Quetzalcoatl which has, well, we could go on for an hour about them themselves, but like, <laughs> but like it just, the, the inner orders, it, it never ends. And these guys that we researched, they, I mean, they really were up to some very disturbing sick shit. Yeah. I mean, they've been busted. I think we covered at least two times with court documents that I would need to found, or I even made pacer accounts for some of the stuff to find. And I mean, it was not bullshit. Uh, I mean, trafficking uh, people, girls from New York to Kentucky. Um, some of them might've been prostitutes or girls from massage parlors, but they were illegal, uh, underage. Um, There's different accusations on, you know, where they obtained the women, but they were definitely underage. They've been busted for that. Same thing in Brazil. Um, I think we showed you with that guy, uh, forgot his name, but he had like the wet line tours. He had almost kind of like a thing with uh, like Epstein did. He had a girl that he would send out to the village and would go, go find us some chicks tonight for all these, you know, rich dudes I got coming on the tour. I had pictures of the girls and everything. I mean, the shit did happen. So that's proof right there. And, you know, if you think about it between both of those orders, you got the Shriners. They're big for the circus that's around kids. They're big for the hospital because it's for kids. Then you have the jesters who like dressing up as the clowns to hang around the kids. And then you have Quetzalcoatl that, we, you know, I'm not saying we have to get onto that, but just this is another one of the inner orders that also is associated with transporting the kids for the Shriners. The biggest area for Shriner Lodges, and I think the biggest lodge that they have is in the Philippines. In the Philippines, I think you can only be 12 years old, maybe 14, but I think it's 12 and your legal age of sex. So it just seems very shady that all these things connect. Yeah, and I have tons of notes on uh, Quetzalcoatl. We'll get to that in a few moments. I want to go back, though, to what you were saying. So some of the research that you guys have done, um, let's go back to the Shriners just for a moment. There was this one nugget that you had or one story that you found. Uh, in 1992, there was a surgeon in Cincinnati uh, yeah. who, was, who was investigated for drawing smiley faces on the sex organs of burn victims at one of these Shriners hospitals during surgery. And then the same surgeon, it turned out, had also carved his initials onto the skull of a nine-month-old burn patient. What the fuck is going on here? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that one. That was... and let's also remember that he was not fired. There was a, an investigation about that, and they promoted him and said, oh, I, we could never get rid of such a terrific doctor. He's just so amazing. They were actually like keepsakes, things to keep them happy during their recovery. And to me, that's absolutely absurd. It just seems as though they keep protecting more and more of these men in the jesters. And if you look at the Shriner hospitals and you look at 
a lot of the organizations surrounding the Shriners, and you look at the boards of executives and the guys that are at the top, many, many, many times, they're royal order of jesters. So you just got to wonder why it is that these jesters are being promoted to the highest levels of Shrinerism if there's such a small order and really aren't significant or things like that. Yeah, and also the guy who started the jesters, uh, Colonel George Filmer, I believe his name was, right? Yes. Um, he was associated also with the Red Cross. Red so Cross. You, yeah, so you have like this interesting play between like healthcare on some level and these yes. these secret groups, and then like obviously these hospitals are targeting kids. So it's kind of like where there's smoke, there's probably trafficking, right? So yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm just not really sure like what to make of these connections, other than just going all the way you know to the most extreme. Because like when you see these stories that you guys pull out, and there is a lot of sex trafficking, there's a lot of prostitution, there's a lot of underage kids. And then you have these hospitals and these circuses and you have these people who are involved in all these like philanthropic endeavors like the Red Cross, even though they're not much of a charity. Right. But yeah. you just have all of these weird connections. It's, you know, it's again, it's a spider web. It's not really some like inception level stuff. It's more of just like a web that's being weaved under the surface that nobody can see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you were to even go, sorry to interrupt you, Lux, just real quick. You mentioned that guy Filmer before. If you were to even go and read, I think, like the paperwork that that conversation, that letter was about, it has that guy going to all these different fucking places to be like, uh, I think, gathering information or looking to see what's going on during like some type of, it was some other epidemic. It was like some other like disease that was going around. And I'm like, I don't know. It just seems fucking fishy. You know, it makes me think of now, honestly. You know, has this been something that's been going on forever? Are you speculating that they are using these sort of epidemics or these pandemics as covers for more of these sort of covert operations that they're up to? Yes. yes. Oh, so, or, 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 or the whole reaction, you know, the whole, uh, you know, we're going to do something so we get the reaction to give us the reason to do what we want again, you know. I forgot how David Icke <laughs> says that. He has his own like little thing that uh, a yeah, problem, reaction, solution. Yeah. That's the uh, yeah. Hegelian dialectic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's honestly our approach to research. Is so, okay, we never take a subject and we say, oh, well, let's find out the worst possible things that we can about these guys. Trust me, we've been trying for months <laughs> and months and months to find an order where these things don't necessarily go back to these same themes of, of sex and kids. And it's just this weird trend, you know, I, I we aren't out to destroy all these orders and to make them look bad. We legitimately are investigating them because we're trying to find stories that are similar to our stories and our experience in the secret society. And it just seems like the more that we research, the higher levels that we go up in these orders, it, the same thing is, it doesn't seem as though it's an isolated incident of just, okay, well, this group and this group and this group, they just happen to be doing it. It seems to me like it's organized well-funded and still as prevalent today as it was two, three decades ago. I, and I was going to say too, I can't remember the name of um, that song that we had featured on one of the Shriners episodes where it was a, a he was a, he was a very famous country singer at the time who was a oh, Shriner. God, I forgot his name. Yeah. 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 I don't really remember his name. I'm sure we can find it, but he released this song because he was a Shriner that was, talking about what a Shriner convention is like. And the whole thing is, you know, well, we make it seem as though it's very official and very, you know, important. And this is all about, uh, you know, getting all of our orders together. But then really, they're talking about a verse after that in the song of, well, the secret thing that we were going to do is actually all meet together and play poker tonight because we're not, you know, you can't do this. It's unsanctioned. And we got all these girls that are going to be around. And like, it, he's putting it right there out in the open. So I just thought that was a very curious thing from someone who's a self-proclaimed Shriner. Yeah. Even like you mentioned, like not even trying to look for kid stuff. When we eventually started, the only reason I think we went really into Quetzalcoatl is because me and Lux prior to even getting into this stuff had believed that something was behind QAnon. We had believed that that was a psyop. We started coming across Quetzalcoatl and started seeing things from that that actually was a really good tie. And then, of course, somehow kids have to get tied in. So like that wasn't even the reason for that. And it just ended up fucked up like that. It was Ray Stevens, by the way. Ray Stevens' song is called Shriners Convention, 
definitely go and check it out. Again, this isn't what we're saying. This isn't conjecture. Just take a look at the lyrics and, and you'll see what he's talking about. So. so to stay with the Royal Order of the Jesters for a few moments, I wanted to talk about mirth because I'd never, <laughs> I'd never heard of mirth. I didn't know who or what mirth is. He apparently has some sort of gospel that these people live by. So whoever wants to start here, who or what is mirth then? And, and what is this gospel that the jesters are sort of living by? I think it's like kind of embracing like you're kind of like, I think what Lux was really saying before, almost like some mischievous, mischievous frat boy, kind of like a jester, just being fucking silly and stupid, pulling pranks. I mean, there might be other things in there besides that, but I don't want to just make guesses. I mean, the one thing I would say is that if you look at that deity mirth, right, and then you compare him along other type of entities, the most applicable entity that you could put in comparison to mirth would be Pan, yeah. which is the same type of personality. It's this mischievous, you know, it's a trickster. Almost Loki uh, type as well, too. Yeah, Loki. And, you know, it's uh, hypersexualized and, and things like that. So uh, in the occult, of course, I'm sure you know, a ton of different names for the same entity or the same energy. It's just depending on uh, what region of the world or what time frame it comes from. Yeah, what I would say, what I think it really represents is some kind of, I guess, archetype or, or picture for something that's going to degenerate you even more. Pan, in my opinion, is a god that can really get you locked down into earthly things. And I think that's what that figure is about itself. You know, mirth. I think it's more of like a, I hate to say sigh up again, but you're just going towards a mindset that is just taking you farther away from where you should be going as a magician. Yeah, definitely. And then if you look at the, uh, the way that they sort of treat it is it almost seems like just the language at least suggests that they're saying that this whole world, this whole life, this whole experience is a joke. It's all a joke. It's all something to be, you know, made fun of. They have information that other people don't know. So they're the court jesters, you know, they're, they know the real situation that we're in, whether that be like a matrix or a, a prison for your mind, you know, on earth and stuff. And so that's what you see in their, uh, in their literature is that, you know, this whole thing is a joke. Uh, and so just have as much fun as, as you want with it really. Yeah. And to build on that, you mentioned this phrase or this, I guess it's like their like initiation manual, the book of the play, right? Yeah, It's an interesting title. You know, if you're talking about some sort of simulation or some sort of matrix, right. Or even just some sort of like a Shakespearean, all the world's a stage mentality. And I also think of it, like, I didn't tell you guys this before, but I'm, I'm very into pro wrestling and I, I sort of, oh, view nice. the world. it's its own version of a circus, right. But I kind of view the world that we live in as a pro wrestling spectacle, which itself, it, you know, pro yeah. wrestling is a sort of giant play on reality, you know, what's real and what's not real. And the play that they're acting out in this manual that I mentioned, the book of the play, it sounds like it's more about protecting each other. Like looks to your point that this whole reality is fake on some level, but also we have to look out for each other, right? Mm -hmm. Just curious real quick, who's your favorite pro wrestler? Probably Chris Jericho, actually. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. That's not a bad okay. one. That's a badass pro wrestler to be your favorite, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. You look at the, the stuff that they're talking about. It's all about protecting each other. It says a jester does not investigate another jester. I think it's a lot of it's about that. Uh, you mentioned the whole, you know, the whole world is a stage. I mean, I even took that whole book of the play. I think when we even came across that, me and Lux were both like, yo, doesn't that sound cuish? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we just found a weird correlation, too, between um, they always talk about in, in the initiation ritual that they have killed William Shakespeare. And that's why the person who is being initiated is on trial. We found a lot of evidence uh, with some other stuff sort of um, after we got done researching the jesters that would point to the fact that this could be them saying that they carried out an assassination on William Shakespeare or someone within that realm group whatever secret societies at the time, and that they more or less hijacked Shakespeare um, when, in fact, it was under the certain name, or it was under that name, but it was really Bacon. I've actually seen a lot of stuff saying that the Shakespeare was just a made-up name for the Masons to release stuff. Like, that was, like, other Masons that wrote shit and put it out. I've listened to so many different people talk about so many different theories about, you know, who Shakespeare is or was, <laughs> if he was even a real person, if he was a group of people. You know, I have no idea. 
I've heard so many compelling viewpoints on this from multiple perspectives. It's like, I don't know. And I don't think we'll ever know. But I think it's interesting that I think it's interesting that you guys say that like these orders, not just the jesters, but um, the order of Quetzalcoatl too, like has this fascination with Shakespeare. And then you bring in this, you know, like all the world's a stage, the book of the play stuff. Like it just, it fits really snugly together. You know, like it feels like that there's something here that, that maybe Shakespeare was some sort of a Masonic creation or maybe even beyond that, you know, just like some group that we might not have even heard of. There's an importance for his name for some reason, if he's mentioned in both orders, in my opinion. Like you said, we may not know, but there is an importance if they're bringing him up again. Yeah. Yeah. You even see it in uh, really high levels of masonry, too. You'll see that come up in uh, Royal Arc masonry, and especially in the, the higher levels of, of uh, certain Masonic groups. You'll see the Shakespeare thing come up once again all the time. Yeah. I just want to say one more thing about the pro wrestling stuff. You know, we talked about the circus. It's a really sort of interesting analogy for a big play or a big show, you know, very similar to pro wrestling, which, you know, both of these things, the circus and the the wrestling matches, they take place in a ring. And the Shriners actually say their circus is three rings of fun. I don't know if you guys recall that sort of like jingle that they had on those ads. I just thought that that was an, an interesting connection that that these plays, which which bend reality or or at least they sort of interact with the audience in this sort of like, is it real or is it fake sort of way that they take place in a ring. It feels like a magic circle. Like if you really want to get down to it, that this this ring acts as a sort of form of a magic circle and then creates this sort of faux reality for you. Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk yeah. about that. I no, I totally agree with that. I think... Uh... I mean, not to be cheesy, but I mean, I could even look at the three ring circus as I'm saying like the supernal triad. Hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it is like you're saying, I, I mean, I would even contribute this to a version of the Scarlet Whore in a sense. Is, here is some entertainment to give you illusions. Here's a pretty shit to look at. Let's mesmerize the masses as we're doing something else or it means something else. Hmm. Or why other things are going on somewhere else. You know, who knows? Right. Yeah. So I do this, think it's a mass just, you know, thing to keep you occupied. And ooh, look at that. Because something that we have found with pretty much every order that we've investigated is that you see, unfortunately for the right, as far as politics are concerned, the right always blames the left for all of their problems. And then vice versa, the left blames the right for all of their problems. Right. And to me, when I see this this analogy of the, the whole world's a stage. When we look into these orders, we don't see just liberal. Did he cut out? Yeah, I was going to say, did we lose him? The masses <laughs> to look at and to think this is actually real, but <laughs> actually it's not. It's uh, the NWO versus the uh, WWE. For sure. That's a great analogy. Lux, oh, you actually... Yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I think uh, we mentioned it on whatever. We mentioned, I think, wrestling, wrestling and politics are a great comparison. For sure. Yeah. You know, you got Macho Man going against Hulk Hogan, but then, you know, the fucking boys kicking it backstage being like, yo, you know how much money we just made over that fucking match? Yeah. You know, I love this storyline. Good job. (laughs) You know? Yeah. I mean, that was a thread that I ran through my podcast was that not only pro wrestling reality, but politics is is exactly what that is. I I feel like politicians have learned from pro wrestlers and Trump himself was pretty embedded into the the pro wrestling world throughout the 1980s. So he probably picked up a trick or two. And speaking of tricks, I just wanted to kind of tell the audience too, like, you know, how perverse and debaucherous these groups are, but showing it through just like a very seemingly innocuous thing. And you guys went through in one of your videos, you showed a series of pins that the jesters would wear. I pulled out one. I just just want to describe it to people. It's from the jesters of Montana. And it depicted a jester member with a white robe or something similar. And he had the robe open. And at the opening was a sheep right at the height of his dick. So the implication to me visually was that the sheep would, may have been sucking the jester's dick. Yeah, that's and, really cool. Which could be construed in two ways. I mean, like, obviously, there's some bestiality implied there on the surface. But I think, like, more sort of subtextually, the implication to me was that Maybe that sheep represents just a normal human who's, you know, sort of oblivious to this. Yeah. Yeah. Taking advantage of the sheep. We're fucking Yeah, just, yeah. Taking advantage of the sheep. Or the sheep is literally just, you know, sucking off this sort of gesture because they don't know any better. Right. So I I just want to point that out. Like, you know, I'll link to these videos, obviously, but that (laughs) you've showed that 
in one of your videos and I was like, that's sort of a great visual analogy of like maybe how they see other humans. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. That's why I think a lot of times, sometimes, uh, you know, when you see pigs and shit, I think they're re referencing us. We just yeah. keep eating this bullshit up. We won't stop. Well, you guys also mentioned, uh, I think it was you, Patriot. You mentioned the Wet Align Tours and that guy, Richard Scher. Don't need to go yes. into to much about him, but you did just rattle off a series of, of cases where this guy and guys like him were just involved in all these weird businesses, kind of like front organizations, I would call yes. them, and that they were tied back to, to human trafficking, sex trafficking, prostitution. You also mentioned this congressman, Gus Bilirakis from Florida. Yes. And his involvement in some of these busted prostitution rings, and there's that word ring again, by the way. And you also shared a video of Trump to bring him back in, thanking this congressman who was connected to these prostitution rings at a rally of his in Florida. So I'm glad you picked that up because I don't, yeah. I'm not sure if too many people did, but May maybe that's that a little telling, just, you, you know, know yeah. you know, maybe think about that, you know, and yeah. he is in Florida again. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is where uh, Jeffrey Epstein was right for uh, a, his, a lot of stuff in Florida. Yeah. A lot of stuff in Florida. Yeah. You know, so, I know there's a lot of people flocking there these days because of all the, the COVID hysteria and the, the COVID nonsense. But it's just interesting that like Florida has popped up a lot actually in your research with these yes. groups. And there's a lot of, a lot of interesting dealings and front businesses you know, going on down there. You know, and what we didn't cover, I can't remember if it was Moose Heart or the Shriners. I think it might've been Moose. They have a retirement thing, if I'm correct, I think in Florida too. They do, yeah. We just weren't looking to drag out the series, you know, too long because we already have like four episodes for, with it because we're including Gacy. But, uh, you know, that I found that to be very interesting as well. Again, another secret society with a fucking retirement place in Florida. Yeah, um, seems like the same locations. You see Texas a lot. You see Chicago, Illinois a lot. You see, yeah, uh, yeah of course, Florida, New York. There's some Arizona. There was a lot of lodges in Arizona for the Quetzalcoatl. Yeah. A lot. The Philippines, yeah, even though it's not in the United States still. Well, I think, you know, what's so interesting, I kind of mentioned this when I transitioned into these topics, was this jester archetype, the clown, right? Like, this is all very fascinating. Clown world. Yeah, clown world, exactly. And it also brings to mind, you know, the trickster figure from certain mythologies. And, of course, the fool archetype from the tarot as well. And, you know, Stephen King's It story is about a clown preying on a group of kids. And then you guys pointed out, like, the insane clown posse. They have this very weird subculture yes. they've created. But then and you they also all have stuff what? pointing to 17 as well. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Like, there's this really interesting connection to the number 17 with the ICP videos and some of their stage shows. I think it's on some of their album artwork, too. Yes. Yeah, they talk about it in the music as well. Yeah, I don't know where this clown world comes from, and maybe we could talk about that. But you also have these very, very obvious pop culture references. I, I mentioned It, but also the Joker character in DC Comics has become quite popular recently. You know, like ever since, I guess, the Heath Ledger Dark Knight movie, and his death is obviously very mysterious, coming right after he plays that character. But then you also see, like, the Joker suddenly warrants its own movie. And you don't normally see villains getting their own movies in these comic book worlds, right? Like, that's a trend, though, recently in Hollywood for these properties to feature the villains more in these standalone movies. And it seems like a total inversion of what's moral and just and good with things that are the exact opposite. And then getting people to identify with this inverted reality where we're kind of following evil right? Instead of following what's good and what's moral. Yeah, I mean, you see the rise of the anti-hero, right? And sort of the villain has become the new hero. Uh, I mean, especially in the new uh, Joker movie that was, I can't keep track of them really at this point, because it seems like there's one that's always coming out. <laughs> like I saw like, a trailer today for a new Batman movie. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Which one, like, which one is this? Which universe? <laughs> but anyway, like, yeah, you see the whole story of the Joker and sort of the end scenes of the new uh, Joker film. You know, everyone's wearing a mask and you have this mass hysteria. People are burning down cop cars and all of this, like, burning down the entire city. And uh, it's sort of like this rebellion against, you know, any type of structure or morality, but also saying that, well, we're trying to take down the corrupt system. But in reality, the corrupt system is, you know, same guys that got voted in the same way that we have it here. So it's just, it's almost like a, a foreshadowing or a prediction of what was going to happen not long after that in the real world, because obviously look at what happened last summer. <laughs> you know what, you know, what I thought was a, another interesting thing you mentioned, you know, the Joker movie, 
me and Lux, I think I might have seen more of it, but uh, we did come across stuff with uh, people in Quetzalcoatl really liking Godzilla a lot. And there had been a, a new movie recently, too, with that. And they seem to have been very excited and happy about that, actually. And, you know, Quetzalcoatl has to do with some sort of serpent type animal. I found that interesting, too, just like another movie. You know, they seem to have, uh, I found some that were like fucking drawing comics about it, you know. So there's something about that as well. But uh, with the Joker and the clown world, my opinion is with some of them, if you were to really believe that we live in a matrix, if you wholeheartedly believe that and thought this really was a bullshit world and it really was just an illusion or a prison, if you believe that and it was your reality, if that was my reality, would it really make a difference if I like was literally to walk up to you right now, Ryan, and blow your brains out? It's not real. It's fake. His soul's going to go somewhere else and he'll be in another vehicle fucking tomorrow, today, in a million years. But it's going to feel like that probably and he'll never know. That's their mentality. This shit is a fucking joke to them. They'll do whatever they want because they don't think it's really real. If this is really just a 3D prison that we're experiencing it really is a fucking joke and it doesn't matter. But how about like we try to be fucking civil and enjoy ourselves and not go against other people's will while we do it. But they don't think that way. We're just going to do whatever we want. So it's a fucking clown world. It's a joke to them. I would even say sometimes on the fool card, the reason the guy's got a smile on his face as he's about to walk off the cliff is because he knows it ain't real. And to be perceived thinking like that in front of normal people, you would look like a fool or insane. You know, so I, I think a lot of them really do view the world like that and have zero fucks about how they conduct themselves during this experience. That's a good segue, I think, into uh, Quetzalcoatl and the order of Quetzalcoatl. You sort of touched on already what this figure is, but maybe you could talk just a little bit more about it for the audience. You know, who or what is or was Quetzalcoatl? Yeah, uh, I mean, I would say Quetzalcoatl is... It's a, uh, an entity or a symbolic energy that has been shared between multiple cultures, you know, the Mayans, the Aztecs, and something that we see that kind of, that, that they all practice was this human sacrifice. And I'm talking about thousands and thousands of people who were sacrificed to this entity. They would do terrible things. I mean, uh, murder children on altars, you know, and uh, drink their blood. So whatever this entity is, obviously can't be really too, um, <laughs> can't be too kind or friendly of an entity, right? If it's asking you to do that to your children. I mean, of course, there are other accounts of Quetzalcoatl where it's, you know, this benevolent thing. And that's certainly the way that these orders try to form the image of, of this entity. But you can't, you can't forget about all the other stuff that this entity was associated with because it's brutal, brutal shit. So in my opinion, you see also the symbolism with the butterfly with Quetzalcoatl when they didn't have kids or, or people to sacrifice, then they would uh, eat or sacrifice butterflies. And you see that a lot in, um, I would say the, the modern day CIA projects and stuff where they're using the constant monarch butterfly themes. And to me, I think the Quetzalcoatl, you know, this plumed winged serpent, whatever that is, I don't believe it to be something to be worshipped or pure or something that people should venerate or respect, honestly. It's a flying serpent with rainbow feathers of all yeah. types of feathers to have, right? I actually sent Patriot this link the other night, this movie that came out in the 80s called Q. And it's all about a flying lizard based off of Quetzalcoatl. And they actually reference him in the movie. I guess it's like terrorizing New York City. And it's just yeah. fl it's just flying over the city and just murdering people and like tearing their heads off and tearing them like limb from limb. And uh, it's also got a little like kind of organized crime angle into it where the only person who knows where Quetzalcoatl or Quetzalcoatl is living is some sort of like low-level mobster. And so he's got to lead people to destroy this flying serpent. So very interesting movie. Um, very interesting, you know, sort of symbolism. Yeah, go ahead. No, that's interesting. I should check that out. Uh, Cause yeah. I, I, I did come across it and then you showed it to me. I totally forgot all about it. And I, I, I should probably see if I can find a version of that and watch it. I'll send you uh, be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting if there was like something like actually in there. Yeah. Yeah. And like, if you take a look at, okay, so it's a serpent what are serpents associated with? Well, the reptilian brain, the reptile mind. And what does the reptile mind lack? It lacks empathy, it lacks emotion, it lacks care, right? Because literally reptiles do not have that portion of the brain scientifically. So there's one attribute about this entity. And 
I mean, to me, that says a lot more that, about it than uh, I think that a lot of people kind of pick up right off the bat. It's an instinctual animal. And again, with the, the, the rainbow plume type theme, I see that in other stuff, especially uh, things from the Bible. Often wondering if that's maybe like an optical illusion from the people who may be looking at this thing or, or maybe something, uh, something different than that. But yeah, just weird similarities I found. Yeah. The order then that takes the name, the order of Quetzalcoatl, you said that they were, they're another sort of inner order of the Masons and the Shriners and the Jesters, and that they operate more near the U.S. southern border and into Mexico, right? Yes. Yeah. What does the order then believe about this entity that they're named after? Do they view this entity as, as like a godlike figure like or like Jesus-like figure? I, th- I mean, I do think it represents, you know, maybe other things besides that, but I... I think uh, most of it is probably going to like, I guess, reenact uh, old traditions to a God that once was worshipped. Yeah. And so the most curious thing. I think the lodges go every year too, right? Lux, don't don't most of them go every year to that pyramid too and and make that. That's like part of the initiation maybe. Yeah. So they make this big pilgrimage to go to one of the, uh, the oldest temples for Quetzalcoatl. And again, with the, human sacrifice thing we always have to keep that in mind but when we were looking at so every year they do this giant party this giant ritual and it's called the feast of fire and it's uh, promoted by the order of quetzalcoatl and uh well it's got to have some sponsors too so who sponsors this giant party well only the rothschilds (laughs) <laughs> you can look at their poster it's like you're going to see like uh, some like concert or something they released this giant flyer talking about all the people who sponsored this giant feast of fire and the rothschilds are one of the first ones on there now what you mean to tell me, what are the rothschilds doing funding for some secret society that's an inner society for another secret society uh, obviously they know more than than what's going on there it reminded me of like an old rave flyer with like all the DJs that were playing on it instead yeah. of their sponsors. I was like, yo, what the fuck? These names are on here. Yeah. And then you look at the other groups that are also funding this Feast of Fire. Well, who are those groups? They are think tanks for political movements such as BLM, Antifa, and other groups like that. So if it barks like a dog, most likely it's a fucking dog. And to me, it seems as though the Rothschilds as a corporation or as a family, whatever, it really doesn't matter. Obviously they know about this group. They're funding this group. And then they're throwing all these different think tanks around this feast of fire to push a political or societal agenda that sort of permeates through what we see going on today. Yeah. Well, if it barks like a dog, it could also be a flying lizard. So you might want to keep that. (laughs) Um, But so one of those groups that you mentioned that, works on the Feast of Fire is this group called Walk the Plank. Yes. Which, which has a very sacrificial ring to it, by the way, walking the plank, yeah. you know, off of a pirate ship. But you did tie this group to maybe some of the COVID hysteria and leftist social movements that you just name dropped as well. I mean, did you find anything definitive that draws the Feast of Fire as maybe like a piece of predictive programming or something? I mean, I would definitely say so. That subject was so huge. The Q series was so massive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I I can provide you with screenshots or people can go check out the episode if they want, but they're on the flyer, uh, the Walk the Plank. And then if you go to their YouTube channel and you look at all of their social media, they're promoting BLM and really uh, something that sounds eerily similar to me to the Great Reset. So yeah, I don't find that to be just a coincidence. You know, just to um, tie some of this back together with the jesters and the sort of clown theme, you shared a brief video at the end of the second video of your Q series that sent me down a clown sec rabbit hole. I never heard of clown sec. <laughs> you no, know, it's and funny. So- I was I was just thinking about this, and I'm I'm like thinking in my head because you're asking about walk the plank, and I was like, there was so many things that we could have still have added that we wanted to. We could have easily have made it like a ten part series, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, and then there's stuff that I and me and him even were like, you know what? We'll throw a few little things in there. We're not going to say what it is. Well, we want to hopefully maybe some people will pick it up and realize that we might be pointing the finger at them, too. But we just didn't want to come out and say it. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's just what happened right here. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I'll try to describe what Clownsec is. It feels like 
Discordianism with the clown suit on, you know? Absolutely. Like it, it feels like a bunch of people who take up a sort of activist role, but it's it's very jokey, it's very pranky, but it's also like very serious. Like I don't know much about them, so I'm just kind of going off the top of my head and what I remember from my clown sick rabbit hole the other night, but it felt very dirty to me. Kind of like replacing the Guy Fox mask with Anonymous just with a clown wig and makeup. The same like general premise, right? That's the exact same thing that it is. I mean, to just be frank with you, Clown Sec was a group of uh, former Anonymous members <laughs> um, and they decided to branch off and leave from Anonymous and they took up the persona of Clown Sec, meaning Clown Sector. Because in Anonymous, you have all these different sectors. You have B, B sector, you have literally dozens and dozens of different sectors for each different specific thing in Anonymous. And of course, Clown Sec branched off and they left. And it almost seems to us that it's possible that maybe there were some contracts that were going around at that time that could offer some resources or maybe some money to a, some well-skilled group of people who knew a lot about memetics, knew a lot of, about how to influence society. And then maybe there was some type of connection where ClownSec was promoting QAnon or, or at least disseminating it on 4chan, Reddit, because that's where ClownSec definitely uh, likes to spend a lot of their time. So, I mean, if, if you go and look at the things that we dropped and you go look at those videos, if you can find them or know who they are, you will see, you know, stuff almost 10 years ago that they were putting out in like, you know, people that were part of it or that they followed that just, just like them um, putting out stuff that would really tell you exactly how society is going to be today and throw in some actual real legit occult symbolisms up on the wall and on your face and shit. So when you start thinking about that and um, the fact that they're very good on the keyboard, I could easily see how they could have maybe had a hand in where we are today. At the very least, it's a really fucking disturbing website and disturbing group to sort of try to learn about. It's just one, you know, who really likes clowns, first of all. And so to see like a like a sort of rogue activist group that takes up this persona or this mantle, like it's just kind of disturbing. So, you know, speaking of other things that are pretty disturbing, I wanted to tie this back to, you know, perhaps what we could call QAnon or the Donald Trump sort of weird esoteric connection with, you know, Pepe the Frog and some other stuff that popped up around the same time as all of this, you know, back in 2016 and maybe even a little before that. But, you know, at one point in your research for the Order of Quetzalcoatl, you showed this image of a guy with a crown and a frog and a cat. What was that image representative of exactly? Jabulon. It's a god that the Freemasons, uh, and I know... It's spelt a little bit differently, but I'm pretty sure it's the same entity. Um, I have seen that name used in OTO rituals as well. It's kind of like, in my opinion, it's almost like a holy trinity or a triad of gods put together. But uh, the frog is on there. Uh, there's a cat and then there's a human. I think it's just like another symbol for negative manipulation. Or like the inversion of what would be yes. considered the traditional holy exactly. trinity. Yeah. Yes. Symbolism you see over and over again with that uh, with that subject in particular. Did you notice that the stuff with Pepe that we found from the Mason site? Yeah, that's what I was trying to sort of get to was that there's this. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, yeah, there was a guy that uh, I ended up finding a site that was uh, I was looking for like just Shriner people. When it came to um, some of the old Shriner sites and uh, Quetzalcoatl sites, if you threw them in the Wayback Machine and you actually go look at them. They were very open and brazen about their personal information, you know, and I was just like, damn. So like I was at some point, I was literally copy and pasting names and just trying to see if I can find these people linked to anything. There was one person that I found that he had some kind of charity and listed that himself as being a Shriner. And then there was an online business that he owned that I think it was like called like adult expressions or some shit like that. And uh, you went, you know, if you went to that now, I think it's down or whatever. It's something completely different. But when I threw it into the Wayback Machine, at one point it was a porn site. Then another point in part, it was actually a legit uh, prostitution site. You could go to it and I think look by state and area and see where girls were available. But when it was the porn site, when you would go to it, um, one of the top clicks, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I do believe it was a child pornography site. 
if you ever use the Wayback Machine, sometimes it's not going to be able to show you every single image, but it will show you the text, you know, and stuff. You'll still be able to read the site. You just may not have a photo that used to be there. Um, when I clicked on it, half of the site was already gone, but what I could see definitely looked illegal, and then I just got off. So I do believe it did have a link for child pornography. And uh, at the bottom, you know, they had like other suggested sites again. And I think it was like maybe six squares at the bottom, whatever it was. And there was one that uh, had a picture of a frog. And I think it's, I forgot what it said, uh, cozyfrog.com. And I was like, yo, what the fuck? I was like, yo, cozy frog. I was like, that sounds familiar. So I went and clicked on it. And I was like, yo, what? Yo, there was like, there was a, uh, I think like at least another four or five cozy sites. It was cozy academy, cozy this, cozy that. And it was called your uh, online adult buddy or some shit like that. Like porn buddy didn't use friend, but it used buddy, you know? And I'm like, yo, come on. Is this like Pepe? And then I'm like thinking about how the Masons do have that Jabulon who, you know, one third of it is a frog. He is pretty fucking prevalent. I will say, you know, and maybe some people think I'm being a little harsh about it, but I mean, I think people idolize that image. I think people use it as a, an image for themselves. You know, that that picture has become you. That has become the mask that you put on when you go fight the uh, internet fucking war. You know, or your little keyboard fucking warrior over here on Instagram or Twitter. That is the mask you put on. You know, and you think that you're doing something and all you're doing is just giving that shit more fucking meaning and more energy. I just want to clarify something about the website research that you guys did for some of these groups is that you took legitimate domains that were at one point connected to these groups. And then yeah. you just searched them in the Wayback Machine and you saw that they changed at certain points to yeah. sex related or prostitution related websites. Yes. And I thought that was super right. interesting. What I also found interesting was when you were doing that for stuff related to the order of Quetzalcoatl, you came across this uh, Q7 lodge and yeah. you showed an example of their website on the Wayback Machine that it actually changed from the Q7 lodge to showcase companies that were involved in wargaming in both the public and the private sector. Do you guys recall that? Uh, oh, of yeah. course. Yeah, I was... Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were, you know, going that way or not. Yeah, yeah I so. honestly, I th I was really happy with that piece right there. I really thought that, um, you know, it, it could still look almost a little bit like a stretch, but I think when you put it in with everything else, I'm sorry, there's like you said, when there's smoke, there's fucking fire. Um, there was a Q7 lodge. I don't remember if it was an Arizona one or whatever, but eventually the site just ends, and then pretty much just like a pop up comes up now when you go to it. That has like tells you it has been changed to a Q7. It's like a triangle might even have a the Q and the seven in there. And then at the bottom, I think it says that it's it's where Quirk Solutions and then uh, seven something company put together. And I think there's is, I can't remember. I'm sorry. I can't remember the exact names of them. But then when you go to start looking up these two companies, um, one of them we found a lot more on than the other one. I did find in the video, I think it might have been for the seven company or something like that. It's called um, the guy does make a hand gesture. He makes that, that lower triangle hand gesture with his hand. And they do focus on that for a few seconds. Yeah, they zoom uh, into it. Yeah. So I just thought that was a little questionable. But the other one, I, I think it was Quirk Solutions or something like that. That one, I really think that was some some wild stuff. If you go and actually look at like testimonies and what they say that they do. We played some of them. I mean, they even talk about like the red team and the blue team, you know, which could easily be the red pill and the blue pill right now. Uh, and I could even see that it really fit occultism as well. In my opinion, the power and the glory, but they're talking, you know, I do believe that. Yeah. I mean, they even admit to war gaming, but I do believe that they are involved in the QAnon thing as well. Yeah, especially if you, if you take a look at one guy that we covered specifically was uh, a man named Watkins. And Watkins is the owner of 8chan. So he's the, he's the guy who now is in control of 4chan, or 8chan, I'm sorry. And then if you look at all of the Q drops that were being sent out to the masses, they were all being dropped on 8chan. Suspicious, right? So Watkins is former military and he spent a lot of time in japan he was the first guy to ever import japanese pornography into the united states and then he later moved to the philippines 
So uh, Watkins, he's running 8chan at the time that Q appears. Now, there was a documentary that was made, I think it was by a and I'm not sure, don't quote me on that. HBO maybe or some shit like that. Yeah, but they did a uh, documentary. They wanted to find who the source of QAnon was, and for them, it, it brought up uh, Watkins. And they had a lot of good evidence. I mean, I don't trust everything by the mainstream media, but that one looked, that research looked pretty solid to me. And, uh, you know, I will say we knew who Watkins was prior to that. All right. That wasn't what led us to the guy either. Right. Right. And, and you can see Watkins. He's got tons of involvement in the QAnon movement. He's promoting it. He, again, he was the administrator. He's the head of the, the site. Even his son goes by code monkeys, monkeys, yeah. another shrine of fucking symbol. Yeah. And even, even an order of Quetzalcoatl uses the three monkey thing for one. Of, I think it was the Canada, Canada Lodge or something. They have the hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil monkey pen for uh, their Quetzalcoatl Lodge. So, I mean, even that just looked shady as well. Some some dude that was some this hacker that's doing all these crazy drops on Twitter that's going to come and save the world with QAnon and Trump did jack shit, except for mesmerized people like his father's doing. Yeah. And you look at sort of what was Watkins involved with when he went to the Philippines? Well, uh, he was doing some really shady stuff with a pretty underage girl. He was posting those pictures online. Fast forward 2016 and beyond, you know, all of this stuff is being promoted on 8chan and, you know, he does nothing to stop it. He can be seen. I can't say that it's exactly at the 6th of January, but it's eerily close. I mean, he's on the steps of, of the house with the Trump shaman, shaman right, yeah. with the horns shaman. and all of that. He's seen there uh, at that rally. Then he does this subpoena in front of, I think it was Congress. I'm not sure it could have been the house. But while he goes into that hearing, he's wearing a Q pin. He has a Q on his lapel as he's going into this hearing. And... Again, they proved over and over again that it seemed as though this guy was totally in charge of every aspect of 8chan. How did he not, how could he not see that this was true or if this was fake? It seems to me that he knew that it was fake. It's part of a, a psychological operation. He's been involved with a lot of weird, shady porn stuff before. And it seems like they pretty much brought a bunch of different groups together, just to spread the QAnon conspiracy out to the masses. And they were just using different proxies in order to get that done. But I've heard you guys say that regardless of the legitimacy of QAnon, like, okay, it's a PSYOP. I think that's kind of obvious at this point, but not to discount some of the information, right? That oh, they exactly. Share. They're telling you what's going to happen because like Alex said before, what is it? What's the name for that that whole thing with the, if we, sh- if we tell you the truth? Monstria. Yeah, it, yeah, that's exactly what I think that is. What so, did you say? It was when they, when they kind of give you... They are telling you what's going to happen. And those drops, I mean, people are learning stuff. But the whole thing is like when they're showing you things and it might actually be correct, it's still part of like the whole magic spell. Yeah, from a from a magical principle, if I say to you, Ryan, I'm about to put a curse on you and you do nothing to stop it, right? If, if I said that to you and you did nothing to stop it, well, then I'm not held responsible for my actions because you've been told about the information and you've done nothing to stop it. You know the reality, you've done nothing to stop it. But on a larger perspective, that's what QAnon more or less was. They have to tell us what they're doing behind closed doors. That's part of what the QAnon drops were. Look, we're showing you everything that's going on here. Now, not everything QAnon said was right, but a lot of what QAnon said was true And a lot of things that people, they now want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, because QAnon was proven to be fake because nothing happened and Trump isn't the president, that he obviously has to be fake and everything that he said beforehand was a lie. That's absolutely bullshit. There's so much truth in the QAnon drops. So you have to take that information, you have to consider it, and you have to realize that it's real information that they're trying to tell us of what they've done and they're doing, and they're going to do. And if we don't do anything to stop it, then these magicians who are in charge of the the psychological operation and this black magic that's going on behind closed doors, they told us about the information that they're going to do. And if we do nothing to stop them, then they are free from any type of karmic repercussion. The only way I think you can really stop them from doing it is actually just by not looking at it anymore and paying attention Mm -hmm. to it. 
Yeah, that's kind of where I got was I'm on the record back in 2017. I said Q was a psyop from the first moment that I heard about it. So I'm actually pretty proud of that. But also, Lux, I don't consent to any curses. I do appreciate your offer. Uh, but I, I don't <laughs> consent. Um, back to the Q stuff then, just for a moment. This stuff is maybe loosely related to it, or maybe it's directly related. But you did sort of weave that in with the Cicada 3301 mystery right. that popped up on the internet several years ago. You also tied this into sort of like Black Cube Saturn worship. To me, and I, I'm not going to try and speak for New York Patriot, but based on our research, I think that it's pretty conclusive that Cicada 3301 was the precursor to QAnon. They were trying to probe the internet, especially those who were on 4chan and Reddit, in order to see who was intelligent, who was curious, who was into the occult. If you look at Cicada, you see all of these constant references to magic, to folklore, to magical works to Crowley and uh, it's pointing people in this, you know, problem solving type of situation. And well, what do you see again happen just a couple years later, the same operation on a large scale with QAnon, same Q drop, same information seeking, problem solving, trying to find out, you know, what's really going on. And to me, it seems as though that Cicada was a test bed, a smaller test bed, but nonetheless an effective test bed to be able to see how big of an audience that they could gather while trying to do a psychological operation and so then you see QAnon roll out and it's almost the exact same blueprint and we can we've tied so many people to the original cicada to what is QAnon I'm talking about the exact same names that appear over and over and when you know when the QAnon dropped the whole thing was to infiltrate the majority of people who you know you're just on Instagram you're on Twitter or you're on Facebook this stuff is being taken from 4chan, 8chan, and Reddit, and then brought into like the larger social media platform so that people begin to buy into what QAnon was. I mean, they did a really good job of it. I, I got to give them credit for that. I mean, the QAnon PSYOP probably the most effective maybe in history, because there's still people that even believe that today. Yeah. But it was definitely coordinated. You look at the groups that were coordinating it, we found Black Cube Intelligence, which is Israeli intelligence, uh, information gathering community. It really goes deep. I mean, these these guys, uh, they knew what they were doing. I, I definitely agree with Lux. I think it was a, a precursor. I think in some ways it was like, you know, it was like, let's see if anybody even bites on this. To see if we can even get something like this going. I also believe, in my opinion, if you were to get really far into that cicada thing, you had to have a good understanding in occultism. Yeah. So I think another reason why it's a precursor to uh, QAnon is I th do believe that this was a way to recruit like uh, keyboard magicians, really. You know, who's sitting behind the keyboard that's going to be willing to go through all this crap and really kind of has an understanding of what the fuck's going on through occultism. They're probably might actually have like half an idea and, and maybe if you get just a little bit far enough they'll just be like oh this is a good sheep or this is a good magician but i do think they were probably looking for people that they knew they could use to spread magic through the internet so basic question just a yes or no answer do you guys think then the order of quetzalcoatl the order of q as it's known is actually maybe representative of QAnon. Do these things actually go together? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Okay. That's the sort of conclusion I think one could draw from that or one, one should draw maybe from that. And then the other thing to tie up the sort of clown portion too is that you mentioned this phrase clown world. We've, we've dropped it several times here, but you've referenced it in a way that it makes it seem like it's some sort of anthem for the political right. We live in a clown world, they would say. Is that sort of like a revelation from them? Like they're maybe saying like, yeah, we actually live in a clown world, you know, like whether that means that it's sort of a fake reality or it's a world run by these sorts of uh, hidden orders that we're talking about. I'm not really sure what you were getting at with that. Could you maybe specify what you mean by when you hear this term sort of thrown out there by the political right? Well, I, I think the understanding when you start seeing it, you know, on memes and stuff on the internet, I just think, you know, it's a misunderstanding of what it really probably means. And I really do say, like, it's it's as if these people don't consider this reality. Like, I really do mean that. Like, I, I think these people probably, you know, fuck around a lot. Some of them could be being manipulated, too. 
I will say that as well. Some people on these upper things, they could be being manipulated. But uh, I, I do think a lot of people do really view this as a matrix. And it really is uh, bullshit to them, really. I mean, I hate to say it. Like, they just think, like, we're going to do what we want. And we're a part of a team that's going to create a spectacle for the rest of everybody else to not see what's really going on. They're really like entertainers as well. Yeah. And it's just a a big illusion. I mean, if you look at the symbology that was being passed around the last couple of years of the Trump presidency, what did we constantly see? We saw Trump. He's the clown president. This is the clown world, right? And that was being pushed by the left. But then things switched. And now Biden's president. And now we're living in clown world. Things are so ridiculous. There's no way this could possibly be true or real. It's too crazy to think is actually real. So it's got to be a clown world. That is being pushed by both, and it's not organic from the left or the right. It's not people like you and I. This is people who are organized, who know that both both parties are working together to achieve a goal. And by pushing clown world to both the left and the right, they're able to pre-program the population. And now what the terrible thing about it is we are retweeting it. We're retweeting it. Now Now you see all these Republicans who are like, oh, we're living in clown world. So they have a, a picture of Pepe with like a clown wig on and a, and a, a red nose. And But what that really is doing from a, a magical standpoint is perpetuating that of initial psyop. Because now both parties are agreeing that we live in a clown world and that we are accepting it because we're retweeting these memes and these the same type of imagery that they've given to us about the clown world. When you take that back to the jesters and their imagery, I think that it's not far stretched. Think that they know, they know the plan. They're executing the plan. They pit both sides against each other. They make both sides believe they're living in clown world. When in reality, they're controlling all of that. And we're just along for the ride and retweeting all of their shit. Yeah. And that was my concern with the QAnon stuff when it first sort of became mainstream was that not only is it out there now for people to to sort of embed them or program them in their subconscious, but it sort of like legitimizes what's actually happening. You know? Right. Sharing it so much while you're on your couch on your phone just retweeting it or posting about it. Like, man, like that does nothing. Like you're complicit now with that. I don't know yeah. if that's how you guys see it, but that's kind of how I saw it. it. was like, you can sit here and complain about it all the time. That's fine. But if you're not going to actually go out and do anything about this stuff, then you might as well just shut the fuck up about it and stop paying attention to it. Because then it's going to remove some of that power that it has over you yes. and us and society, right? Yeah. Well, if people just shut off the news for fucking two weeks, change something, I'm sure. You know, but like you're even saying with that, like stop fucking listening to it. That makes a difference. And you look at the imagery of what is the jester, what is the clown. It's, of course, you see it in Shrinerism, the world order of jesters, etc. It's this idea that they are the guys, like New York Patriots said, that are putting on the play. They're the ones who are making this all up and we're just participating in it. Uh, None the wiser. And from both sides, they're being manipulated, but they can't see the common symbolism to see how it's both used for Trump, but now used for Biden. And it's just... From a magical standpoint, we are accepting that reality because we're now retweeting it from both sides are saying that's where we exist. I mean, you know how you know how you could say that these symbols can be used as a psyop and shit too. I mean, I'm watching Christians put Pepe in Jesus pictures with him. Yeah. Really? If, you, if seen- you're a Christian or a Catholic, I don't know. Is it a fucking account that I follow? That I just, I don't know, I need to unfollow it. It's like one of those accounts <laughs> that, that pisses me off. And I just like seeing it every once in a while on Instagram. Not going to put their fucking name out there. But like, I've actually gotten into an argument with this person over Pepe. Putting up pictures with this motherfucker chilling with Jesus. And I was like, I think this is when uh, they talk about false prophets and idols in the Bible. You know, and this motherfucker spazzed. You know, had to inbox me and blow me up. And not act like a fucking Christian at all. I think that's part of the psyop. I mean, you literally have people that, 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 you know, are claiming that God is, God is the one, uh, God's got this, uh, don't do anything. And I have pictures with Pepe and Jesus, like you're just fucking delusional. And not to say that we weren't delusional too. I, I mean, I'm, 
I will admit, I bought into the QAnon shit. I was like, oh, yeah, here we go. We're about to pop off now. Everyone knows about Pizzagate. Everyone knows about all this other stuff. I won't say I was the biggest fan of QAnon, but I, I thought that what he was saying, what whoever QAnon is or they uh, were saying was good stuff because it got the information out to the public. But again, that's a double-edged sword because now the public does know. And it puts us in a sticky situation because... We now know, but there's not much being done about it. And we kind of are just waiting for someone to come and save us. So I have a ton more questions, but I don't want to keep you guys too much longer. But I do want to end this on a positive note. So, you know, we're talking more about, I think, here, magic and, you know, what role it's playing in the world and, and how we are sort of interacting with these spells every day or these curses even maybe if you want to go that far. We don't even know it. But one of the things that we still have in this life is personal agency, right? You yeah. know, like you said, we can turn off the fucking news at any point. We can disconnect from this stuff at any point. It's all voluntary. It's a voluntary interaction that we have here. And there was something that you guys mentioned in one of your videos, I think it was one of the first three videos that you did about why you started the project to begin with. It was like the original conversations that you had together for New York Patriots podcast. Right? Yes, yes, Be yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Before you broke off and did your own thing. So one of the things that you said that I thought could be a positive way to wrap this up that maybe does give people some advice of some sort, some sort of spiritual or magical advice to take to be able to help ward off all this stuff is you said that prayer is very important in this life. And you also said that there's a difference between prayer and mantra and that you should focus on prayer. And I was wondering if you guys could maybe just, you know, sort of Talk a little bit more about that. And, you know, what is this difference between prayer and mantra? Like how much power does prayer actually have over our experience here? It's a tough one, actually. I'll try to keep it simple. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, even when it comes to this, I mean, depending on what your concept of God is, I mean, I don't know if it'll make a difference. To be totally honest with you. But I do think it can be uh, very powerful. You know, you have to have a good understanding or idea, I think, of what you even you know, think God is. I would say mantras actually would be more powerful, you know, maybe for somebody down the road, because it's almost as if like you're reassuring yourself, kind of. I mean, even even at the slightest level, if what you're telling yourself and asking for, if it's a positive thing, it's almost as if you're programming it in your head and it's becoming a serious thought, you know, so that might even start making you change certain actions or behaviors that you don't even know why you did. But it's just because it's a goal that you're going for or something. But I do think it's also good to, I think prayer is good just to get into a uh, routine of trying to talk to God and acknowledging that there's something greater than yourself out there. And hopefully that idea should change for people down the road too of what God is. But I think it's a good way to open up a discussion with uh, yeah, something greater than yourself that's positive to look for advice from. Yeah, and we hear this sometimes. It's like, man, why do you guys always talk about like dark stuff? Why do you guys always talk about like the scary stuff? It's like, hey, we would love not to carry or to, to cover scary stuff. But it's sort of like when Paul Revere was running around and he was telling everyone, hey, the British are coming, the British are coming. You could do one of two things. You could say, well, let me go check it out and see if the British are really coming. Or you could say, conspiracy theorists, these guys are crazy. They're, for, they're fear mongers. We do not want to push fear. That is the last thing that we want to do. We're at a precipice now, and we're trying to tell people, wait, we've been in the shit. We've seen what's going on, and we're trying to give people a heads up. It's like, imagine if people just like, you know, took Paul Revere and burned him at the stake because he was giving the information that was actually going on at the time. We're not trying to create fear. We don't want it, we don't want more views. We don't want more of your money. We don't ask for any of those things. We've been there and we've seen what's going on. And we're trying to tell people that there is a plan that you are unaware of. And these guys are well orchestrated. They're well funded. And the thing that they are most afraid of is you. That's what they're most afraid of, because they know that the moment that people understand these occult messages and these symbols and what's going on around them, the whole thing is a mind fuck. It's a mind trick. 
And the more they can get you down into that mind fuck and that mind trick, you won't have the courage or the balls or, or the audacity to stand up for yourself and for your family and for your state and, and the people around you and say, look, I've had enough and I'm not going to allow this plan to keep going on because I know that this is going to cause a lot of harm, right? All we ask is that we want people to see that there's so much more to detach yourself from this system, grow your own food, spend time more with your family and stop looking at the TV and worrying about what's going on the next day. Uh, you know, Oh shit, this person did this today. This person did this yesterday. Oh, I, that's all an illusion to keep you in a mindset where you're constantly in fear. The whole object from these people, and mm-hmm. trust me, it's a well-orchestrated, well-funded and diverse group of people who are, are doing this. And most of them, no, actually, I'll take that back. All of them are millionaires, heads of giant corporations, companies, religious sects. And they want you to stay in fear. No one is going to come and save us. We can't wait on that. We have to stand up for ourselves. We have to figure out how to detach ourselves from this corrupt system and the black magicians that have infiltrated this system. They've infiltrated magic just to show you how far it's gone. When our research, yeah, when our research, it looks like, honestly, in our opinion, they've infiltrated a lot of secret societies. And there's a mindset, a deep mindset that sort of like has motivated these people to do that. They're not Masons. They're not Rosicrucians. They're not Hermeticists. They come from a different mindset. They pretend that they're a certain way. And then when they infiltrate these systems, then they kind of turn it over for their own will. So Paul Revere, we're trying to warn people over what's coming. And it's not to create fear. It's so that it can create urgency because the closer that we can get to being hand in hand and working together against this, better off we'll be. Because the thing that they're banking on is that we never do that. And we stay separated by fear. And and we just think that everyone's a conspiracy theorist or an anti-vaxxer, or an anti-BLM member, or uh, all these different sections that they try to cut us into. We got to get rid of that, because the only way for us to to bust out of this is to realize the information and then to move forward. I mean, I'll even put it this way. You know, if if we were to lose half our followers overnight because they took our advice and just said, yo, just fuck the internet and stop listening to everything, including us, I would be happy and say job well fucking done (laughs) because I know those people will be fucking happy next week and will be experiencing a completely different life because they're not wrapped around fear porn and politics and what other crazy crap is being thrown at us. Real magic, in my opinion, real magic, in my opinion, I'm sure that New York Patriot would agree with this, is that the real magic is you looking deep inside and finding out the shittiest parts of yourself and getting rid of them and working towards a better person for yourself. Don't look for someone else to come and save you. Find out why you're such a bad person. Find out what, what's wrong, what's, what's good about you. Cherish the things that are good and forget the things that are bad. And that's what real magic actually is. It's a deep understanding of human psychology. We start to I mark just, ourselves. They can't control us anymore. Exactly. Yeah, I think... Uh... Happy, healthy, self-aware people are not the easiest people to brainwash and control. Like if you have that center in you, you know, when you do the shadow work, right? Like when you get to that point where you've accepted yourself to your fullest potential for better or worse, and then you, you make these changes in your life that sort of support that, right? You know, you start to eat better. You start to exercise more. You start to, to pray and meditate more. You start to do that work. Nobody can touch you. You are incorruptible. Yeah. I believe if the human race was just to able, was able to start listening to their soul and their body more, the fucking world would change. Yeah. And the biggest thing that they are trying to subvert, the thing that they're trying to suppress and get rid of these groups, this amorphous group of people, what they want to get rid of is your will. They don't want you to have the power to create your future. The, the, the power to create changes around you, because I, I'll tell you this, I, I don't need 
10 years of occult training to tell anyone, I don't, I don't need some gateway to say that your will, the way that you think, the way that you envision your life, the way that you want things to, to come into fruition, that's what they fear the most. They don't want you to do that because the moment that people turn off the fear switch and the moment that people turn on the, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to get out of this system. I'm going to learn to love people around me to figure out what's wrong with myself and to create a better society. That's honestly what they fear the most. Think about how much money and resources they push towards just keeping you quiet and watching Netflix. Just- fucking Hollywood would go out of business because we wouldn't have fucking idols anymore to worship. Yeah. Well, amen to all of that, guys. So we have so much more that we could talk about. I wanted to touch on Randonautica. We didn't even get to that, which I think oh, is good great, because man. we had a good conversation. So tell the people uh, before we go where they can find you and your work. Uh, so you can find uh, the Occult Rejects on pretty much anywhere that podcasts are streamed. Uh, Rumble, you can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Gab. You can find us on BitChute. Uh, still working on a website, but turns out that is fucking pricey. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's on a whole for a while. Yeah, it is. <laughs> if you want a decent yeah, one, yeah. Yeah. well, we're working on we're working on it. Yeah, but yeah, you can find us anywhere at those sites, and uh, we would absolutely love if you tuned in and, and listened. We appreciate and love you all. Yeah, we got a, a Discord as well, and you can find my show, the NY Patriot, on uh, most most podcasts. Uh, still on YouTube. I don't know how. I'm on there, BitChute and Rumble and uh, Odyssey. Oh, I know. We're also both on Alt Media United, I think it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you. That was a good know, interview. Thank you. Was it, well, yeah, thank you. And you're the first interview I've done in two years. So. Yo, that's fucking impressive. Wow. Oh, for you. I, I appreciate Yeah, I mean, this guy came with notes and questions and everything. I was like, yeah, <laughs> man, this is like a real interview. Yeah, I was one it, of the best interview. interviews we've done. Uh, yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. For I think there's only you and one other ch- lady, uh, Janet, that's interviewed me a few times. That's actually done like a job like you have. That's impressive. Well, Seriously, I, Ryan. I, I mean, <laughs> do some interviews, and, and you you really did your research. You you actually listened to the. Uh, it's like I, I don't even care about. I'm just I'm, I'm very appreciative that you listen. Yeah, to that means a lot. Yeah. yeah, that blew my mind. <laughs> no problem, guys. Hey, yeah. Thank you so much for, you know, I don't know how much you knew about me or the show I did before, but like I did take that hiatus and felt a little rusty when I started to try to dig in and like really focus in on what I wanted to talk to. But once I got into the material, it was it was super fascinating and it just sort of like told its own story. Right. So I have awesome. to thank you guys for all the research that you have done as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I appreciate you. that a lot. And there you have it. My thanks again to Lux and New York Patriot. Be sure to check out their work, particularly on a video platform like BitChute. It's a better experience than audio only. And if you're like me, you can also digest it on BitChute at 2x speed. I don't know where I'd be without that 2x speed, man. Anyway, one thing I neglected to point out here was that all of the groups discussed here, they are all registered as charities. Of course, with that legal designation comes many benefits, monetary and otherwise, but it also reminds me of the one thing that I've learned about charities or philanthropic groups with a ton of visibility. They always seem to be fronts for something nefarious. I think you look at an example like Susan G. Komen, a charity always top of mind here at the end of October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, as if we're still not aware of it, by the way. And this group contributes almost nothing to cancer research, but instead spends most of its money on trademark infringement lawsuits. Then you have the Red Cross, whose CEO makes like high six or maybe even seven figures, and very little of their funds actually go to their so-called humanitarian causes. They also seem to always be on the scene in places like Haiti, where there's documented human trafficking going on. So to call back to something said here in the chat, if it barks like a dog, it might just be a flying lizard. Speaking of flying lizards, that whole clown world theme and the phrase itself brings new meaning to the enjoy the show phrase that we've heard trumpeted by the Trump and the QAnon crowd over the years. What a fucking circus that has been and continues to be. And here's another thing I took from this chat. Maybe the thing that I took from it. And you're going to be like, what the fuck? Why would you take this from everything discussed here? But let me just lay it out for you. The thing that sticks with me the most is the idea or the term or the symbol of the ring. I mentioned it when talking about the circus, three rings of fun, obviously the ring, very central to the pro wrestling spectacle, all the matches take place in a ring, covered in canvas for what it's worth. 
And then for some reason, this term also gets used in prostitution. You have a prostitution ring or other types of crime, perhaps, like drug rings. And for me, this just conjures up an image of a magic circle, which is also a ring. But also, I can't help but think about people when they get married and exchange, you guessed it, wedding rings. And everybody wears them on their left hand, the left-hand path. Now, before you go crucifying me, I'm not advocating against marriage. I'm just saying there is definitely a ritual involved with a ring, like a circus, like pro wrestling, like the magic circle. And maybe we should just consider who and what is involved with these rituals that we did not come up with and what exactly we're committing to. And lastly, you know, this discussion does, I think, conjure up some rather difficult pills to swallow. For some of you, this is nothing new, hearing this type of information. For others, it might be new. Might be a red pill, could be a black pill, but ultimately, I think it's a pretty big white pill. The point was made during the chat that magic is all about personal growth, personal transformation, personal transmutation. It's the shadow work, and that shadow is something we've all had to face in the last few years, individually and collectively. If you want to say macro and political just to better drive home the point, the Trump years were the beginning of that phase, I think, phase one of it. And now with COVID and Biden and everything that's happened recently, it's phase two. It's deeper. It's darker. It's scarier. But I live maybe rather naively by the axiom, heal yourself, heal the world. And I think that's something to keep in mind and in heart as we move forward here, because we can't go back. You can't go back. The good news is, is that the way forward is authored by you, because you are the authority here. You are the author of your story. And it's time to reclaim that authorship. It's time to reclaim that authority. So with that, I must bid you all adieu for now. Until next time, you know what to do. Love yourself, think for yourself, and question. Actually, no. Let's change that up. Love yourself, think for yourself, and reclaim authority. Authority.